Hi everybody, have you seen that video on Satan and his guide to the Bible or have you watched other videos by Pete Enns about the Exodus and you're wondering, did the Exodus really occur or are these videos fallacious? Are these valid concerns? Dr. David Falk is the perfect person to answer the questions about the Exodus because he is an expert who has a, uh, let me go ahead and tell you about his degrees just in case you're wondering. So he has a a master's in divinity from Trinity International University and an MA from the University of Toronto and a PhD in Egyptology from the University of Liverpool. He's authored some great stuff, including this book here called The Ark of the Covenant in its Egyptian Context. His whole focus is on ancient Egypt. He has a channel called Ancient Egypt in the Bible. And so we're going to talk about the Exodus and we're going to just do a kind of a little bit of talk on the Satan's Guide because the video is a little disturbing. It has a lot of kids on it, unfortunately. It's about indoctrination and it's had a million views to date. So without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce Dr. Falk. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. So you and I both watched about half of this video, and I'm just wondering, and it basically uh, is, is horrible, and you even know who the person who's a source and of the material. I, 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 that I feel like I, I've gotten, I, I put an hour into this that I'm never going to get back. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a great way to put it. So what were your thoughts on the part that both of us watched? And we I couldn't take it anymore after the first half. I had to stop. It was insufferable. <laughs> I mean, I I mean, besides all the logical fallacy and uh, scripture twisting and all of that stuff, it was just, I mean, it got obnoxious. It got really obnoxious, especially when they started panning to, say, the bits on on evangelical scholars at an academic conference. You know, this is not exactly they're going to be their most dynamic moments. So, you know, the, the disingenuous nature of it was just, um, was very hard to stomach. Very hard to stomach. Yeah, it, I, I agree with you. And I, th I think they, they had William Lane Craig in there. They had Frank Turek. They had a bunch of other people. And they've got it making it sound like William Lane Craig is totally behind the Canaanites and all this stuff. So let's let's just break down a couple of the key arguments and assumptions that were in that video that you would say sure. are false. So what did you see in there that you, well, number one is the dating of the Exodus. I guess we should. Okay, now they are going to assume, this video does assume an early Exodus date. That's no longer the majority opinion within, say, evangelical scholarship. Most of evangelical scholarship now is either going to be, say, believe that there was no exodus, because that is still of an opinion within evangelical scholarship, or they're going to go to a late exodus date. Okay? And frankly, whether or not the exodus actually happened doesn't affect Christianity a whole lot. It just maybe shifts some of the underlying assumptions of it. So, but the whole idea that the Bible has a categorical date for the Exodus is complete myth. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that was something that's been uh, an idea that's been championed by some early date proponents, but it really doesn't have any firm foundation. But they do seem to basically, they, they hold to a very fundamentalist, wooden literal reading of the English Bible. Okay, Satan. Satan is a is a great believer in the English Bible, especially the King James version. <laughs> he loves that version. <laughs> <laughs> Best version ever. So, what's your favorite ver version of the English? Which version do you prefer? <laughs> I'm curious. I think there's a lot of good versions out there right now. I'm a particular at the moment. I'm kind of I kind of like the Christian Standard Bible by Holman, uh, I think that's a very good translation. It's a good even-handed translation uh, yeah, between, uh, say, a dynamic translation and a, a grammatical equivalence translation. That's good. So does it have the correct translation with respect to the 2 million or 600,000 people who left? Well, you know, that's, that's a very interesting thing because that, that whole 2 million number that they keep citing isn't found in the Bible anywhere. You don't find that in the Bible. That's not in the Bible. That's an interpretation of the censuses that you find in Numbers chapter 2 and 26. 
Now, the sort of the consensus now amongst evangelical scholars is that there wasn't two million people in the Exodus. Okay. The Exodus, uh, the nation of Israel, is described as the smallest of the nations that's going to enter into the Promised Land. So it's not this mass throng of people. Second of all, later readings have shown that um, more current modern readings have shown that there are alternatives to those census figures that, say, defy a wooden literal Western reading of this. But the problem is, though, we're not exactly sure how to read that census. It's possibly uh, a census of clans, not of individuals. It's potentially involving, say, heroic figures. So basically, your mighty warriors, a count of mighty warriors, there's or, or chiefs even. There's even a genre interpretation of that, basically that this is war literature, war chronicle literature, and war chronicle liter literature is known to exaggerate numbers for polemical reasons. So we're not exactly sure why those numbers are the way they are, or exactly how to read them. But Satan's Guide to the Bible picks one, and that just happens to be a wooden literal reading followed by a expansive interpretation. Mm -hmm. So it's not really telling you what the Bible says, it's telling you why it's being interpreted. Mm -hmm. And so they're undermining an interpretation. But we don't know if that was what the author of the Book of Numbers intended. Very interesting. So I, I have to say, so number one, so we believe that the book of Exodus occurred probably in the 13th century BC. Yeah, around uh, 1263. And under which Pharaoh was this? Ramses II. Okay. And so the other thing that I had noticed is a, a lot of some Orthodox Jews like Ben Shapiro have also said that's when it occurred. A lot of them are on board with the idea. So it's not, this is not that it's, it's been well accepted in every belief system that it comes in the 15th, 15th century. Instead, we're talking about the 13th century. And mm -hmm. in your other videos, now I, I kind of take took some notes and I just wanted to point a couple things out. So uh, that I think that supports not only your date, but also supports the Exodus occurring just as we believe it occurred with the Israelites leaving Egypt and going over to Canaan and conquering Canaan. Of course, they talked about the the Israelites being the Canaanites and <laughs> in Satan video. Oh, well, I, I, I thought that was precious. I, I thought that was precious, where they basically said, well, you know, there was no Exodus. These are Canaanites. The Israelites are Canaanites that aren't leaving home. And they're stealing land where they're already living. Wait, how does that work? Okay, am, am I supposed to get sort of outraged that some guy in England doesn't leave his cottage in England and steals the land of his cottage in England where he lives. Am I supposed to get worked up about this? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so there, there, there's, this, there's a yeah. consistency problem here. There's a consistency problem with, with Satan and his, his exegesis. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. So, and, and then they get in there with William Lane Craig and others and talk about the Canaanites and how awful God is for, for taking the land away from the Canaanites, but yet they were the Canaanites. It, it doesn't make any sense. And, and the slaughter never happened. <laughs> but yeah. the idea of it is what you're supposed to get worked up over. Okay. So they got that covered. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, I think they make uh, an incredible admission to and by accident which I thought was really funny. At around uh, minutes 2017 seconds, um, Satan says that the Israelites entered the world stage east of Canaan sometime around 1200 BC. Well, you know what? I would agree with him. <laughs> I think he's I spot on. <laughs> spot on. Absolutely. He's, he's not off by much. <laughs> He's only off by about 20 years. 
Exactly. That was that was actually funny. You caught that. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that. I was just going. Wait a minute. What? This is supposed to be against my view? No, I don't think so, dude. <laughs> exactly. I so, wonder how they showed up. <laughs> Could it be an exodus? <laughs> exactly. That's what, see, I've got from other videos that you've done and something and Inspiring Philosophy has said, I just want to lay a few things that you've talked about in these other videos that support the exodus and the date. So we have mm -hmm. archaeology, treaties, some symbolism, mm -hmm. rituals and customs, uh, the furniture, which is one of your expertise. Uh, mm -hmm. loan words, Egyptian names. So those are just a few things that I know you've uh, talked about. I didn't know if you wanted to pick any of those or if you want to just to, to give people a little peppering of what's well, the Well, I mean, we, we know, for example, that if, if there was an exodus, if there was an exodus, it would have happened around the city of Avaris, okay? And that's because the Bible has two identifying markers, a land of Goshen and a land of Ramses. And we know where both of those are. So we can correlate that to around the cities of, of Avaris and Paramses, that region, okay? And pretty much everyone who believes in a historical exodus thinks that they came out of that region, that, that, that city. Now, that city was abandoned mid-Dynasty 19, right around 1265. 20 years later, you're into 1225. The first mention of Israelites in Canaan is in the Merneptah Stela in 1217. And then, of course, we have Satan placing the Israelites in Israel 17 years later. <laughs> Good stuff, Satan. Good stuff. <laughs> Perfect. Absolutely beautiful. Did you now? Do you want to listen to a little bit of the a portion of the video so that we can give people a taste of what this? Oh, is? Oh, sure. Why not? <laughs> All right. So here's where he starts with his uh, eisegesis. I guess you could call it. Oh, there's a lot of eisegesis. <laughs> here's we go. Here we go. Freedom. Liberation. The Bible says Israelites lived in Egypt for more than 400 years. Slaves. Stop. To the, Empire. <laughs> the Bible tells about a great man. Okay, you know, that whole Israelites living in Egypt. Um, it's a bit of an anachronism, okay? One of the things we have to understand is a bit, it's a bit of an anachronism. And they weren't called Israelites when they lived in Egypt. They become Israelites during the wandering in the Sinai. It's the exodus that makes the Israelites Israelites. Up until that point, there may be sons of Israel, but they're more commonly called Asiatics. So the Egyptians are going to call them Asiatics. Okay? So you're never going to find a sign in Egypt saying the Israelites are here. Now, what's also interesting here is Satan is using the Masoretic text when he quotes, say, um, Exodus 1240 to say that the Israelites were there for 430 years. Well, given the text critic criticism of that particular passage, it's more likely that the original passage read Egypt and Canaan. We know from Exodus 6 that they spent less than 350 years in Egypt. So Satan is doubling down on a particular English and basically Masoretic reading of the text. Okay, I think you can continue. That's great. And and so it's just so people know when you say the Masoretic text, when did that come about? The, just so that people are aware of the Well, we do have um we do have readings of it going back to the 1st century, but it be basically was a, became a cohesive text around the 8th to 10th centuries AD. Okay. Great. Okay, so let's keep going. So, so far, we're, we're not even barely into it, and you've already debunked a ton. <laughs> so, here we go. Moses. That's Moses. Moses takes on Pharaoh and his empire. Not an empire. Egypt was not an empire. It never was an empire. It was a hegemony. There's a difference between an empire and a hegemony. 
uh, hegemony asserts control over a neighboring nation, but allows those nations to keep um, keep running their own affairs. An empire takes over and essentially rules it. The Egyptians didn't have the resources to run an empire. They didn't want to... The Egyptians knew empires were expensive. The whole reason that Egypt had a hegemony was to shore up crippling inflation. So they needed tribute to bring goods and services back into Egypt to reduce the cost of, of goods in their own country. So the last thing that Egypt wanted to do was spend money on an empire. So for them, all they wanted to do was take tribute, go home. And even the garrison towns they set up there were primarily, they were not there to enforce the will of Pharaoh. They were there more like monitoring stations and to collect tribute. Hmm. So Egypt never really had an empire. Yeah, one more thing wrong. Here, here we go. <laughs> Egypt's land, let my people go. Let my people go. The Egyptian pharaoh did not let go of Moses or his people. More than two million Israelites. You guys, in we've covered that already. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the fact is that that's an interpretation. Mm -hmm. That's not actually what we find in the Bible. It's it's a it's a it's an interpretation based upon a literal reading of the census is in numbers two and twenty six, which are now known to have alternative readings. And these are not these these uh, readings shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone at this point, since they're even now included in standard lexicons like Halot. Yeah. So it's not it should not be a surprise to anyone that these alternate readings exist. Never leave in Egypt, okay? Like never, never, ever, ever. So God intervened, attacking Egypt with 10 truly awful plagues. The last plague, killing all firstborn children. Yep, you knew I was gonna stop here. <laughs> I knew you I knew love, that I love how Satan inserts the word children. It's not in the text. He has to insert this word to change the meaning of firstborn. Mm -hmm. Now, firstborn has a very, very particular meaning in ancient Near Eastern culture. It's probably better today expressed as designated inheritor. The, basically, the next in line to inherit your stuff when you die. Now, it, it, it's not. It does not refer to ordinal birth. Okay, it does not refer to. And the reason why it doesn't refer to order, ordinal birth is because infant mortality was so high in the ancient world. If if you depended on the first person who was born in your family to inherit, boy, you'd be you'd be out of luck pretty fast in most cases, just because infant mortality was just rampant in the ancient world. So, the firstborn is essentially your heir designate. You could be the secondborn and become the firstborn by your older brother dying. Your older brother dies, your father's still alive, now you become the firstborn. And as long as you stay alive and your father is alive, you remain the firstborn. Once your father dies, you cease being the firstborn and now have inherited. King Merneptah was 13th in line for the throne, and he was still firstborn in his 60s. He was the successor of Ramses II. So that's how long these things can last. So when we talk about the plague of the firstborn, this is not children. This is mostly adults. This is mostly adults. People who have yet to come into their inheritance. 
And the fact is, with infant mortality being what it is, if you lived past the age of six, your chances of living to the age of 60 were really good. That, that's very interesting. And so I heard you say that I forgot to mention on Sentinel Apologetics channel, on Rob's channel. So that's, that's why I knew to stop. <laughs> Once in a while, <laughs> I learned something. So I think, okay. So should we continue going with this one? Should we go to Pete N's video? What it's think? up to you. It's up to you. So maybe we'll do a little bit more on this one and then we'll go to, we're going to, we're also going to look at another video that Dr. Falk says have stronger arguments against the Exodus. So this one's more like a straw man video. <laughs> it's like it is really made for kids uh, and, and unfortunately indoctrinating kids in the process. And so, all right, here we go. Ouch. Listen to what the Bible says. And it came to pass that at midnight, the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt Proving your point. Yeah. Doesn't say firstborn children. Nope. Just keep praying. God's smoting gives the Israelites their chance to finally escape Egypt. Rise up. Get thee gone. For now. We out. But it wasn't long before Pharaoh sent his army to take back the Israelites. Dumb decision. On the banks of the Red Sea, the Israelites' quest for freedom has reached a dead end. Okay. I, Red Sea, did you want to talk about that? Well, it is relying on an English translation. And as I said before, Satan loves his English Bible. It should be rendered Reed Sea or Sea of Reeds. Mm -hmm. But uh, but in the your English Bibles, it's it's the traditional translation is often rendered Red Sea. Mm -hmm. But as I said, Satan loves his English Bible, so he's going to use Red Sea here. So you had mentioned before we got on here that you think you you know the source of the video the person who's who uh, who and you said it was Hendel. I just yeah, you're going to gonna encounter uh, Hendel very shortly here in the video. He's I don't know who the source of of this channel is, okay? But he's going to he's going to res, um, quote several atheist scholars in this process, and Hendel is one of them. Perfect. Yeah, so we'll get to that. Let's, let's check that out. Moses parts the waters. And more than two million Israelites escape Egyptian bondage. Freedom! Freedom! Let my people go! And now a reading from Dr. Hendel. As a story of deliverance from oppression, the birth of freedom, the Exodus story has served as a paradigm for over two and a half millennia. Paradigm. Liberation. And freedom. God acting in history. So the Bible says. But what do biblical scholars say? There is no archaeological evidence that would support an idea of a historical large-scale exodus from Egypt. And that is an assertion. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> that is an assertion. It's not an argument. Okay. And it's an assertion that can be pretty much be pretty easily contested. You know, because we do have the abandonment of Avaris in mid Dynasty 19. Okay. If if that's if if that's where the Israelites lived, that's the first step to what we would expect for an Exodus. That would be evidence, because at what happens in mid-Dynasty 19 is Avaris becomes a cemetery. It ceases being a land, a, a city where people live. It becomes a necropolis, basically a city of the dead. Now, where does all those bodies come from? That's an open question. I'll leave that to your imagination. But it becomes a populated a necropolis at the end, or uh, sorry, in, in mid Dynasty 19. And this is then, around 1265 BC? That's around 1265. Okay. And then 40 years later, you get the first incursions of Israelites in Canaan. Okay. And five years later, you have their first mention in the Merneptistila. That sounds like evidence to me. Now, Handel may reject that evidence, but that's not the same as saying there's no evidence. 
you know, there's a there's a difference between saying, between saying there's no evidence and say weak evidence. Weak evidence is still evidence. So, but I don't think it's that weak. And we can continue with with Handel for a little more, and we can kind of see where he goes with this. Yeah, let's check that out. Now, Handel is he a, a, an expert on Egypt? Is that no, no, he's an expert on Jewish history. Okay. Okay, so let's listen. The exodus from Egypt never happened? He's a Berkeley professor, Michelle. They're all liars there. There's no archaeology evidence for the exodus? Out of Egypt, they did not come. But the Bible says the Israelites lived in Egypt for 430 years. The Bible does say that. Archaeology tells a different story. In early Israelite settlements, there is no Egyptian influence on the pottery forms, on the architecture, on the material culture, the daily lives, etc. No influence. All right, stop. <laughs> now, this is where your expertise. Can you tell everybody before you start what you did your dissertation on? Uh, I did my dissertation on ritual processional furniture in Egypt as a context study for the Ark of the Covenant. Beautiful. Okay. So he mentions four things here. Okay. He mentions pottery. He mentions architecture. He mentions material culture. And he mentions their daily lives. And he claims that there's no Egyptian influence on any of those. All right. Let's take out the material culture bit because, frankly, the other three are encapsulated by material culture. So it's kind of a duplication of categories. It's basically material culture is anything that they, they produce that, say, you know, that, that's part of their culture as such. Okay, so that would include ceramics. That would include uh, how they lived, etc. Okay. So let's just focus on the other three. Now, their pottery forms. It is true that the Israelites had a unique form of pottery. That is completely true. It does not seem to be similar to what we find in Egypt. But it's also not very similar to what we find in Canaan either. It's a distinct form. Uh, it's, it's basically called Israelite burnished ware. And it's, it's something that's very, very typical to, or um, um, very much a signature pottery of Israelite settlements. Uh, it's very burnished, it's very smooth, they took a lot of time to polish it, etc. So we typically find this Israelite burnished ware in Israelite settlements. So it is something that's unique to Israelite culture. Again, not found in Canaanite ware, not found in Philistine bichrome ware, not found in, say, Mycenaean pottery, and it's not Egyptian. It's its own unique thing. Okay. So, but then they've got the other two. Now, the architecture is really interesting because one of the things we find that's unique to Israelite settlements is the four-room house, sometimes called the four-room Semitic house. It's a, it's a form of architecture, housing architecture, that we find at the end of the very end of the late Bronze II B period and into the beginning of early Iron Age 1. And it is something that seems to be particular to Israelite settlements. Now, you know where else we find the four-room house? Take a wild guess. <laughs> uh, Canaan? Egypt! Oh. <laughs> we find ah. it at Avaris. We find a lot of four-room houses at Avaris. So we, you know, we go from this continuity of, say, okay, there's this four-room house in Canaan that starts at the beginning of Iron Age 1. And we don't see it prior to that, but we do see it in Avaris. The other thing, too, is the uh, daily lives. Well, what exemplifies daily lives more than food? Okay. One of the things we do see is a change in the faunal remains. 
So the Canaanites ate all sorts of things. Uh, they ate pig. They ate donkeys. They ate cats. Ugh. Um, they ate all sorts of stuff. Okay? But when you look, start looking at, say, the faunal remains from um, l very late 13th, early 12th century uh, Israelite settlements, you start seeing a change in fall remains. You see a sort of predominance of sheep and goats. You also find that they no longer eat pig. And we know that Israelites, as part of their culture, don't eat pig. It's not kosher. Philistines ate pig. Canaanites ate pig. Anyone else who doesn't eat pig? Hmm. The Egyptians don't eat pig. What a coincidence. They don't eat pig. Why don't the Egyptians pig, you don't eat pig? And the reason why was because pig rearing fouled up canals and waterways. And the Egyptians were very particular about the cleanliness of their waterways. Nobody wants to be live downstream from a pig farm. It's not a good smell. So the Egyptians as a culture didn't eat pig. Now there were some aberrant cults within Egypt that did eat pig, but pig farming was verboten overall. So, you know, Handel when he basically says there's nothing Egyptian about their architecture or their daily lives is pretty much ignoring a huge swath of evidence here. You know, again, the houses. They're same houses that they built in Avaris. The dietary, uh, their diet was very similar to what they were eating at Avaris. Now, sheep, goats, no pig. It is a continuity. So for him to say that there's nothing Egyptian about what they did, and this is not even, we're not even talking about religious practices, such as ritual bathing of priests. You know, we're not even talking about stuff such as, um, um, say, other things such as um, uh, how they designed ritual furniture. Not even that stuff. You know, just the categories Handel mentions here have Egyptian influences. That reminds me of something. Do you think that Moses, and I don't remember if you've talked about this before, but do you think, who, who do you think is the author of the book of Exodus? I think that um, the way that uh, Exodus was, um, and the whole Pentateuch, it's basically the memoirs of Moses. Okay? They're memoirs of Moses. They're written down on, on basically sheets. And then they're collated together to form books. And I expect that the I would expect that the collating took place after his death. So I think the court documents are from Moses. But I also think too that they've there's been updating for grammar. There's been updating to sort of in um, smoothing text has been put between the leaves, mm -hmm. so that uh, one passage flows neatly to the other. So you go get those sorts of, of basically additions after Moses. But the core documents themselves, I would say, were written over that 40-year period of wandering in the desert. Hmm. And he basically just hands a stack of papers and go, here's, you do deal with it now. That makes sense because they did report on Moses being the most humble man, and I don't think the most humble man would write that. <laughs> no. <laughs> so well, you know, you, you see that. passages like this, and 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 Moses said to the people, mm -hmm. and then it's you think Moses would have written that himself? <laughs> no, not yeah. likely. So I like that. And when you're as an Egyptologist who's very familiar with ancient languages and you're looking at the Old Testament and you're looking at those writings, do you have clues that you can see that this is coming out of that period of time in the loan words and in the other things that you see? Oh, in yeah. Egypt? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, you do see uh, as a we would have probably gotten into this more as we talked about end stuff here. But uh, 
Uh, you do see stuff, not just, say, names and loan words. That's just the tip of the iceberg. You see, like, uh, place names. One of the things about place names that are very, very important is places aren't... The names of places aren't just geographical. They're temporal. They fit within a time and a place. This is why when you say do a genealogy of your own family, they say names aren't enough. You have to have a place too. Because places determine context, dates, times, and uh, ancillary documents as well. So in the case of the, like the, the place names we find in, say, the book of Exodus, these are names that are easily pegged to the reigns of Seti I and Ramses II in some way. Almost all of the names that we find, as far as the root of the Exodus goes, at least up to, say, Mount Sinai, can be correlated to those two specific reigns in some fashion. Like, for example, Pithom is renamed during the reign of Ramses II. He renames it. Migdol was built by um, the predecessor of Ramses II, which was Seti I. P. Ramses, the capital of Ramses II, built by Ramses II. Uh, Pihahirot and Balsafan, both are names that occur in Ramesside documents. So these are very, I mean, you start getting that specific as far as places and their historical context of those places, it does lead you down to a specific, at least, era. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. early Dynasty 19. Hmm. See, I think that's good to know because I know that there's a lot of people who try to, they, they take the Pentateuch and they think that, and this is also going into the book of Daniel and other books in the Bible, but they see these prophecies and Isaiah is another one. They see prophecies. So they decide that the, the book must have been written after the prophecies occurred and, and people are reporting on them. And so that's unfortunate. But I think as an Egy Egyptologist who knows the ancient language, it's great that you can point it, that. No, this is actually written during the time. And there's evidence there. Well, you know, this is one of the things I think is uh, kind of ludicrous, say, about the Pentateuch, and particularly the Exodus, is you don't even have to come to it with an assumption of, of God existing and being real for it to see that it is historical. Mm -hmm. You can have a completely naturalistic point of view and still come to a historical conclusion on this. Because we do find things like, for example, the plagues. Oh, these plagues are found in Egyptian documents. They are not one-offs. Maybe the plague, to... maybe the maybe the the plague of the firstborns a one-off, but all the others, all the others have precedent in Egyptian documents. That's interesting. Yeah, they're side effects. Most of them are side effects of the Nile inundation, just hypernatural side effects. So basically, the same sort of effects that occur every year with the flood, just amplified. Hmm. Very interesting. Yeah, I think people need to know that, and I think that's that's good. I'm going to bring in Pete Enz's stuff, since you said he's got a little more, okay. uh, more interesting. So let's see what he has here. Let me just see. Stop. Stop screen share. Get that one out. And let's get this up. So someone told me on Twitter that they were going to talk to this guy. So he also has written a book about the Exodus, I believe. So here we go. There is no evidence for this having happened. There is no actually back it up a bit. Back okay. it up a bit. I can go to you want me to because he has the stuff. Oh, one th one thirty six is where we should stop. One thirty six. Okay, so maybe start right here. Yeah. 21 seconds in. Okay. Yeah. Scholars tend to think that there's something to this story in terms of it having happened in history. For example, um, who would make up a story like this? This is about Israel's origins as a people. And to say, not only to say that, you know, we were 
enslaved for 400 years by the Egyptians, but that our God let that happen. This is a major shame factor. So it's hard to see this just being made up out of whole cloth. Can I talk about that's that? The criteria, that's the criterion of embarrassment. Yeah. Uh, and it's a problem. It's a problem for a lot of those uh, of, of basically skeptics. Because who would, who would make a a story up like this? Like, like for example, like uh, Handel in in Satan's, uh, you know, guide to the Bible. You know, Handel's going to say that well, this is just a story to galvanize the people into thinking they're Israelites. Okay, so you've got you've got a background story, an origin story. Uh, that your ancestors were tricksters, vagabonds, papiru, bums, um, slaves. <laughs> this is not a good look. <laughs> that's a great point. I think that's really important because even when you look at what it's not just that they're slaves. It's not just that they're slaves. I mean, you've got you've got Jacob tricking Laban. You've got Jacob tricking Esau. He's a scumbag. They're stealing idols from Laban. They're idolaters. <laughs> they're Hapiru. They're bums. They're they're loafing off the Egyptians. And then they become enslaved. This is this is this is not even. I mean, this is not even just a uh, criteria of an embarrassment. This is a criteria of shame. <laughs> Who wants this as an origin story? <laughs> That's such a good point. And I, I, I mean, it's all throughout the Bible. Like if you go to King David and how he slept with Bathsheba and he mm -hmm. had Uriah killed. I mean, that's pretty horrible. Yeah, this is this is not just a criterion of embarrassment. This is a criterion of shame. Yeah. You no. Know, who, yeah, who would want this? Because it's not like about... other ancient Near Eastern people said, "Oh, well, gee, you know what? I think I think I'm going to one up my neighbors by making my lifestyle, my my origins, even more shameful. I think I'll throw in some mass murderers, <laughs> like the Benjaminites." Uh, we'll we'll throw in some some serial uh, <laughs> R words. Uh, you know, there's this yeah. there's a, <laughs> you know we're gonna add, we're gonna add all this 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 open up every skeleton of our past going back a thousand years to show how really wretched a people we are. That's true. That's true. Yeah, I'm I mean, convinced. That, well, it's, it's like, it's funny because I look at King Cyrus and in the Cyrus Cylinder and you look at how people were writing about them, like how the kings, how they all bragged about themselves back in the... Oh, yeah, Naram Sin. Perfect so, example. You know, he, he's, he's, he's descended from the gods. <laughs> you know, Egyptians did the same thing. You know, the people were descended from the gods, you know, built by Kanum on the potter's wheel. You know they're no, they're not. They're not said to be ants come from you know, real, real dirt bags. But this is this is beyond a criterion of embarrassment. I think that's something people should probably really think about when they. And I think it's good that he's bringing it up in this video. He's he's saying it this is, is good. It is yeah, It is good. He's bringing it up in this video. And um, as I said, Satan's guide to the Bible has to engage that. And the way they engage it is probably in some of the most disingenuous ways possible, which is to basically insert words. Like, for example, they'll say, well, you know, this was, this was basically a story to galvanize the people. You know, they're a mixed multitude of Canaanites. Well, Exodus 12, 38 doesn't say of Canaanites. In fact, 1237 says that they came, this mixed multitude came out of Egypt. Followed them out of Egypt. 
So Handel has to change the wording of the text to make it read what he wants it to read. Makes it say what he wants it to say. And that's how he tries to get around this criteria of embarrassment. But I don't think it's very successful. You and I agree. All right, so I'm gonna go back to, let me just chop that channel down. Okay, here we go. Let's go back to this again. Also, another reason why scholars think that there's something historical going on here is because of the names. There are Egyptian echoes in the book of Exodus, and one of those is has to do with names. So, for example, Moses is not a Hebrew name, it's an Egyptian name. We see that with, um, you know, some of the pharaohs have this name Moses at the end, like King Tut Moses. Moses means born of. So, Tut Moses means uh, this pharaoh is born of the god Tut. So, for Moses no god to have Tut. that name, it seems like... <laughs> what did you say? There's no god Tut. <laughs> What's he talking about? <laughs> Tutmosis is the Greek form of the Egyptian Jehuti Mosa. Okay? Jehuti is the god Thoth. There's no god Toot. Okay? <laughs> He's showing his expertise here! Yep, yep. <laughs> Real expert in Egypt! <laughs> That's so funny. All right, here we go. There's some, something really Egyptian going on there. So you've got some reasons for thinking that okay, there pause is this. something. All right. Now, he's going to, this is his, this is this core of reasons. Okay, why, why some uh, scholars say that there might be something to this. Okay. But he sort of underplays the, the basis for this. It's not just the criteria of embarrassment, and it's not just names. And he means personal names here. He totally ignores the whole raft of other Egyptianisms in the book of Exodus. Now, we've already talked about local place names and knowledge of local geography. We didn't touch on the fact that this, some of this local geography is off the beaten path. It's not on the major highways. You have to know, it's in the hinterlands, like Pihahi wrote, Basafan, it's not on a major highway. You have to go off the highways to get there, because they're in, the, um, in those towns that are south of the Plusiac estuary, whereas the highway ran north of that. Okay? So you have to have a good knowledge of that area to know those places exist. The other thing is, though, he also, um, uh, you know, skips past loan words. Okay, we can talk about those things such as uh, sesh for linen, uh, etheru for Nile, etc. But there's other things as well, you know, uh, mineralogical terms like mafkat, turquoise. There's also the fact we find customs, Egyptian customs in the book of Exodus, like the birth customs in the book of Genesis, uh, birthing bricks, and the pair of, of midwives. You know, basically, a pregnant woman has to st stand on two birthing bricks to give her elevation. One midnight wife would have a pair of clappers, and she'd clap the clappers to keep in time and have a rhythm for the baby to give birth and keep the mother breathing in sync. Clap, 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 clap. The other midwife caught the baby. <laughs> that was an important function too. Oh, I, I pity those poor women. I had, I, holy cow. I just, I can't even imagine giving birth without the painkillers that they give us today. <laughs> <laughs> like, wow. So the fact that midwives come in pairs, that's Egyptian. Again, because of the use of the clappers. The birthing bricks mentioned in the text. You know, uh, Joseph Wagner III did a really nice paper on some birthing bricks that was found in the Middle Kingdom too. They're beautifully decorated. You know, have have the images of 
of the Egyptian god Bess on it and to wear it, the the hippo god of, of fertility and pregnancy. You know, but these are these were decorated in faience. They were meant to be comfortable to stand on. And these were birthing bricks. Okay. The mortuary practices found in the Pentateuch. You know, the fact that Jacob was mummified. Well, they didn't do that in Canaan. That's an Egyptian thing. And the fact that they got the days counts right. You know, 40, 40 days to mummify, 30 days for mourning. The Egyptians would basically pile natron on a corpse, you know, clean the corpse, pile natron on it for 40 days, and then wrap it up, followed by 30 days of mourning. That's, uh, that's accurate. Um, even, even some of the stuff like baking practices... Like when they put the bread bowls on their shoulder garments, you know these are these are these are Egyptian bread bowls. They're not your typical, uh, say, um, Asiatic bread bowl, which is low and flat. These are tall cylinders, and we even have pictures of scribes carrying scrolls, tall cylinder cylindrical items, on their shoulders in a shawl. We find one of these, these images at Medina Habu. Um, and not only just that, it's also some of the prejudices. The fact the Egyptians hate shepherds. You know, that's a prejudice that goes all the way back to the first intermediate period. Egyptians despise shepherds. So, you know, there's a whole... And, and then, that, then we get into like the furniture design of, say, the Ark of the Covenant, which is an, essentially a... Egyptian design pattern, which is wood covered in, in gold and metal foils. Yeah. yeah. So, this is some... You're muted. <laughs> I just want to show your book really quickly for people who've joined us, because this whole... Your expertise, if, in case people don't know, is on Egyptology. You've written a book called The Ark of the Covenant in its Egyptian Context, an Illustrated Journey. You've got some beautiful pictures in here that you've taken yourself some really great things. So you guys are going to want to pick up this book if you haven't yet and make sure that you, you read it because that's his expertise and you can learn a lot. So there's a lot here that ENDS is excluding. It's not just names. So he sort of straw mans the case here. He, he I mean, if it was just, say, a criterion of embarrassment and just the names, personal names, yeah, okay, I'd admit that this would be a pretty weak case. I'd admit that fully, but there's a lot more here, and ENDS doesn't do that justice. Okay, you can continue on. Yeah, great points. See, you guys, as you listen to this, take notes, because there are a lot of people out there who are unaware, and they're falling for this stuff. They'll fall for what he said, or they fall for what Satan in the Bible said. There's a million people who watch that silly video, and I, I don't know if they were able to endure the whole thing with the... <laughs> Terrible. At least this one with end be ready, like five minutes. Be ready to stop on a dime here because we're gonna we're gonna go and sort of parse this out because this is interesting. He, he compresses a lot in a short space, but we want to take this piece by piece. Perfect. So the next stop should be around uh, one fifty four. Okay. That intersects with history going on in the story. On the other hand, there are a couple of reasons why scholars have really questioned whether this is a historical story straight through. I mean, for example, there's no evidence for this having happened. There's no record or evidence of Israelites being slaves in Egypt. Okay. Now, I love this one. This one I love. Now, first of all, the whole oh, no evidence thing, I mean, we should probably throw that out right now. That's an absence of evidence argument. It's a, it's a logical fallacy. Uh, absence of evidence is is not evidence of absence. It's nothing at all. It's nothing for. It's nothing against. It's nothing. And many historians have, uh, many of a historian has tried to make an absence of evidence ar argument and end up with egg on their face. And David Hackett Fisher has done a lot of work on this. So I would recommend his historians' fallacies for those who want to learn no more about this. Okay, but this whole idea that there's no evidence of Israelites 
being slaves in Egypt. Now, we've already covered the whole idea that the term Israelite is a bit of an anachronism. They're, at this point, they're called Semites. Okay? They're Amu, according to the Egyptians. Amu is, is the Egyptian word for Semites. Okay? And we do know that there were Amu, and a lot of them, around that, that region of Avaris. Okay? So, all we need to show uh, to, to basically show that there was, there's evidence of, of Israelites being enslaved in Egypt is to show that those Semites were enslaved. That would be it. And you know what? Such a document exists. It's called the Biography of General Akmosa, Son of Abana. Now, who is General Akmosa, Son of Abana? He was one of the generals for King Akmosa, the first. The first king of Dynasty 18. Akmosa the first conquers Avaris from the Hyksos. What does he do? He enslaves the population. And some of those slaves are given as gifts to his men. And Akmosa, son of Abana, the general, is the recipient of some of these slaves that were taken out of Varus. There's the smoking gun. The population of Avaris had been conquered and enslaved by the Egyptians at the beginning of Dynasty 18. You really need, if you haven't written a book on all this, you, I feel like you're giving such good information. This needs to, people need to you know, get the word out. Are you working on a book on this or have you? Uh, yes, I am working on a book on this. I, I have to get that proposal done. I have a publisher that's asked me for a proposal. I haven't, I'm still working on it. I, I, I take so much time with my proposals. It's not even funny. But uh, it's just such good information because people they'll say one thing and then you just you have all these great refutations and it's like, OK, it, it's kind of like that when Jesus said, if they if they stay quiet, the rocks are going to scream out or something like that. So they stay silent. So I'm sure people are going to compare me now to rocks. You realize this. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, like with the Dead Sea Scrolls and with all the stuff that or the. Uh, all these different cylinders that we've discovered over the years, a lot of times you have archaeology coming in, uh, showing up and, exp and, and rebutting exactly what these people are coming up with. And so I think like what you're saying, somebody was probably saying that and then suddenly they said, well, so when did this biography, when was this discovered? Oh, it's been around for a long time. It's well known. This is not new. <laughs> this, was a, this was a tomb. This is an actual tomb. It's an 18th dynasty tomb. It's well known. Uh, the text has been translated into English many times. But this is not this is not a new thing. But people haven't connected it. People are aware of Avaris being, say, the home of, say, the Asiatic Semites that became the Israelites. They're aware of that, and they are somewhat aware that the Hyksos were conquered, but. They didn't look at any of the biographies of the conquerors. So they just didn't connect the dots. And clearly really? Enz is not aware of it either. Clearly. <laughs> so great point. No, I love that. That's one of the things that you're doing. And so many, you've given us so many reasons to support the Exodus. I think that a lot of people who are biblical followers and want to trust the Bible, I think a lot of times... Uh, and they're worried that they, you know, they fall for the propaganda from people like Satan Bible guy. <laughs> and so, so let's see what else has to. Do you know exactly when we should stop on this next one? Uh, let's see here. It looks like about two minutes or something. Okay. Uh, it's going to be after the um, the no record of Israelites wandering. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Uh, there is no record of them wandering through the desert for, <laughs> for 40 years. He's going to finish that. You can, you can let him finish that. 40 years. and All right, stop you know, that. All right. Yes, there is no record of the Israelites wandering in the desert for 40 years other than the Pentateuch. Who's 
going to keep that record? That 40 years occurs entirely during the life of Ramses II. The king the Israelites humiliated. You think he's going to keep that record? Who else is there to keep that record? The Shasu? They don't even write. Now, who's going to keep a record of the Israelites wandering around? You know, it's, it's, it's patently ridiculous. And it also betrays a ignorance about how Egyptians kept records and what actually survived. 95% of all the writing we have from Egypt uh, is religious documents. They're religious documents. They're uh, stela for religious purposes. They're inscriptions on the walls of temple for religious purposes. They're not historical documents. And they're not administrative documents. They're not civil documents. 99% of the Everything the Egyptians wrote has been destroyed. Only 1% survives. So, the fact is, we just don't have Egypt's day-to-day -day records. Like, you look, for example, at, say, the royal, basically, the, the day rolls of the royal court. We don't have any of them. From any period of time. We have very, very little as far as administrative documents. We've got a day roll, a piece of a day roll, from a village at Deir el Medina that dates to the end of Dynasty 20. And it's just a fragment. It's just a fragment. This is how we know day rolls even exist. We have half the correspond royal correspondence of the Amarna kings. We have the, the correspondence that came in from foreign kings, but we have none of the correspondence that went out f to them from the Egyptians. It was like, so it's like reading half a conversation. You're listening on the phone, and you hear one end of the, of the conversation, but you don't, can't hear the other end. That's, that's what it's like. So we have actually very, very few records of the day-to-day -day happenings in Egypt. And even less so for this particular period of time, because the capital was at P. Ramses. P. Ramses is wet. Really, really wet. You go there today, you step in a field, your shoe sinks into mud about six inches deep. Okay? Papyrus is not going to survive that. And frankly, most stone isn't either. Because that water is very is is saturated with salt. Much of the salt, the stone that has been removed, basically disintegrates. Because the water evaporates, saline crystals form and break apart the rock. Rock. So the water at Paramzis destroys um, stone and papyrus alike. This is why, for example, at a forest, we find a scriptorium. There was a scriptorium found there, which is basically a room that's used to hold documents. We found 300 clay seals. Not a single papyrus document. And just a small fragment of a cuneiform tablet from the first dynasty of Babylon. So preservation in this area is atrociously bad. The fact is that, you know, any chance of, 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 you know, a record being kept, even if they made a record, which is doubtful in the first place, is virtually, has virtually nil chance of surviving. That's good stuff. Very interesting. And so, thank you. So I'm going to keep going here. I would have left debris or something that archaeologists with rather sophisticated means can figure out. And it's not like people aren't looking for it. Now, Stop. the fact that nothing's been...
<laughs> okay. He's making the suggestion here that 40 years of wandering in the Sinai is going to leave some trace. Okay. Now, it's not, again, we're not talking about 2 million people here. It's probably closer to 10 to 50,000. And that's where basically the ballpark is today for the Exodus. It's about 10 to 50,000 people. And that's based upon the demographics of the Semitic regions of the Nile Delta. Okay. So... That's that's what we're looking at here is in the lower um, five figures. Now, what exactly would he expect them to leave in the wilderness? They quail. Okay, quail is notorious. Bird bones are notoriously hard to preserve. Why bird fossils are so rare in the fossil record? They don't survive. They get broken up and they turn to dust. Pots? Well, they're not making a lot of pots out in the Sinai. There's no rivers. Very few alluvial deposits in the center of the Sinai itself. So ceramics becomes precious. You break a pot, you don't leave it there. You bring it with you. It could be writing material. If it's still mostly intact, you could use it as a pan of a sort. These things become precious in an environment where they are very, very few um, resources. Cloth, going to be precious. It's always precious. Until the 20th century, cloth was an extremely precious commodity because you kept reusing it. And yes, you wore it as clothing, but then it became rags. And you cleaned with it. Okay. Also, the late Bronze Age Sinai was a savanna. It's not the desert as it was today. We do have records of, say, um, Shasu bringing their herds to graze the Sinai. You know, in the Middle Kingdom, they, they even still had cattle. In the, middle, uh, in the Middle Kingdom, it was still a wet enough place that people, you know, migrants were taking cattle across the Sinai and, you know, they were eating off of the silage and, and the water resources there. You know, by the late Bronze Age, that had already dried up to the fact they couldn't use support cattle anymore, but they were onto sheep at that point. So the Sinai was a grazing ground during the late Bronze Age. Well, if it's a grazing ground and if it's a savanna, you're going to have insects. Some of these insects are going to dispose of things such as dung. So even latrines are going to become, say, fodder for other animals and, and insects. So, and so let's say, okay, there's not much left. To, to lose out in the Sinai. All you got left is sheep bones. Sheep and goat bones. Now, how are you going to tell an Israelite sheep from a Shasu sheep? How does a Shasu sheep bone look different than an Israelite sheep bone? You tell me. <laughs> uh, the other thing I think is kind of um, whacked about this is that the idea that people are searching all over the Sinai. They're all over the Sinai. They're looking for this stuff. There's never been a comprehensive archaeological survey of the Sinai. There's never been one. There's been a geographic survey. But that's different. You don't have to dig for that. You just have to be on the surface and map. Nobody has done an archaeological survey of the entire Sinai. Never been done. There's very few people out there. Uh, I don't know what he's talking about here that people are looking. You know, most of, say, the big excavations that have been done in the Sinai have been done at sites where there's already monuments. Like, for example, uh, the Harvard Semitic Museum did um, a set of excavations of Sarabit al Qadim in the 1930s. First of all, that's the 1930s. Second of all, 
There was already monuments there. They went there because they found Egyptian stela and a temple. So for most sites that have been excavated in the Sinai, like the Wadi Magara um, and, say, Serbito Kadam, there's already indications of occupation. These are not camping sites. And frankly, Bedouin today have been wandering all over the Sinai for centuries, millennia. And what do they leave? Nothing. Practically nothing as they move from site to site. In fact, the only, the only way we, we know about Bedouin sites is if they've been visited for centuries. Like, for example, there are some Bedouin sites that have been um, basically um, reused century after century after century for flint, for making stone tools. But it's only because they came back over the period of centuries that they know they were there. That's how we know that a Bedouin has been there. So if I mean, entire armies have marched across the Sinai without any trace. Ezra Hodden's army marched across the Sinai. That's a big army. Do we find a single trace of them? No. How do we expect a smaller contingent like the Israelites to leave a trace? It's, it's, it's woolly thinking. The Sinai is a huge place. It's 60,000 square kilometers. We haven't even begun to tap the archaeological resources of the Sinai. So the, so the, so the idea that, that, oh, people have swarming all over, looking all over the place is nonsense. It's complete nonsense. Good points. Really good points. And I, I didn't realize that about the archaeology. So that's another, another excellent point by Dr. Falk. So here we go and found doesn't mean in and of itself nothing happened, but it just seems very, very implausible at this point in time. There's no evidence for it. Also, there's no record of this in Egypt. And that's the kind of thing you might expect for them to say something about what happened. Now, now you did get into that a little while keep ago. Keep going. Keep going. Some people think, well, you know, listen, of course the Egyptians didn't mention it because it's embarrassing that they got bested by slaves and their slave god. But that's not how it works. If something really bad happens, what you do in the ancient world is you spin it. You make it look, you give reasons that help you save face for why this happened. But we don't see that. Stop. And even forget Egypt for a second. If this something is monumental. Stop. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna have fun with this one. <laughs> He's right that for most of the ancient Near East, that if something bad happens, you try to spin it to put a good face on it. All right, the safe face. That's not what happened in Egypt. Okay. He's showing here that he doesn't understand the Egyptian culture very well. Now, we know that in e Egypt's history, it had many military defeats. I'll name a few. Horemheb lost several battles to the Hittites. Taharqa lost to the Assyrians. Necho II lost to Nebuchadnezzar II. Mary Kare lost to Intef the Third. In Egypt's mil three thousand year history, not a single defeat is ever recorded. How do we know they were defeated then? The victors said so. <laughs> they didn't spin it. They didn't spin it. They just didn't talk about it. And they had lots of defeats to do this with. So they had ample opportunity. So, given that, 
the question then is why is Egypt different here than say Assyria or Mesopotamia in this regard where they try to spin it instead okay the fact is that in Assyria and Mesopotamia defeats were seen you spun defeats as a form of political propaganda Egypt really doesn't have political propaganda it has religion victories are not propaganda they're offerings okay now let me let me explain why that's so different in an egyptian context it's sort of the same thing as when you offer, say, a lamb to Yahweh in Israelite religion. You offer the best lamb. You don't offer the crippled lamb. You don't offer the blind lamb. You don't offer the, the spotted lamb, the defects, the rejects, the wounded, the one that's been mangled by a wolf. You know, you don't offer that stuff to Yahweh. You only offer good sacrifices to Yahweh. Egyptians had the same idea. You don't offer them to offer your gods defeats. You offer them good victories. You offer them successes. And this is because the Egyptians had something in their, their ritual thinking called a reciprocal economy. And a reciprocal economy, a, a ritual reciprocal economy, if you want bread from a god, you give the god bread. The god takes that bread, multiplies it, and gives you back ten loaves. Okay, that's what's called reciprocal economy. You have to give what you want back. You want money from a god? They didn't have money, but let's just use the bronze debit. You want more bronze debits from the god? You give your bronze, de a bronze debit to the god, and he gives you ten back. Okay. You want a victory from your god? You want ten victories from your god? Guess what you got to give them? Got to give them a victory. God will see through you trying to spin it. It's a blemished lamb. This is why the Egyptians never spun defeats. You will not find a single defeat recorded in Egyptian history by the Egyptians. At least not by the losing side. It was a mark of shame. It was something you hid from your gods. It's not something you gave to them as an offering. And all the texts we have, or at least the vast majority of texts we have from Egypt, are those religious types of texts where you give the god your successes and he multiplies those successes. So Enns doesn't understand how the Egyptian mind works. He's basically taking a, a surface understanding of the ancient Near East as a whole and trying to apply that to Egypt specifically. And Egypt doesn't work the same way. Do you know what ends? That's a, those are great points. Do you know what ends his background is, what his, what his expertise is in? Uh, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Yeah, I don't either. I, have, I, I think, I think he's up. Old Testament. I think he's Old Testament, though. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. So everybody who's watching this, if you guys need some refutations of people like this Pete Enns, who's in this one, or the Satan Bible one that we reviewed just a little while ago, or Kip Davis, or Josh Bowen, or all the other people, Myth Vision. So if you need some refutations, you can feel free to take from this video and make your own videos and uh, to, to show that we do have support for the Exodus and we do have all that. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Falk, in advance. <laughs> so. People need to know. I'm going to make little clips of this, actually. Here you go. As about probably two million people leaving Egypt. So many people say that. And so earlier, you <laughs> told it's, us. It's, 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 it's be being repeated so many times. And yet again, it's an, inter an estimate based upon an interpretation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's an estimate. It's an estimate that's no longer seen as credible. So, you know, we got to look at the interpretation again and basically say, hey, uh, 
is this a case where archaeology is now informing the interpretations? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I can understand where the art, where the interpretation came from. Okay, if you've got no data, no archaeological evidence, and all you have is a text, what are you going to base that reading on? You're going to base it on your own understanding, your own cultural context, and what you know best. But as, say, we learn more about archaeology, about the specific context of the region, of uh, genre literature, and the various lexical scope of the language, I mean, that's, a, that's something that we don't often talk about is that even our knowledge of Hebrew is still increasing over time. It's not staying static. We are learning more and more about Hebrew every day. In fact, we've known more about Hebrew, learned more about Hebrew in the past 100 years than the past 1,500. We know that now that Hebrew is a language with a very, very vast lexical scope, a vast lexical range for most of its lexemes. So that has to, we have to be at least then humble enough to say, okay, is our reading of the text correct? Or did we mistake it because we're viewing it through Western eyes? I, I think you made a really critical point. I want to make sure it's highlighted. You made a lot of critical points through this video, but one, one thing that you're saying that I think people really need to, to uh, think about is look at your assumptions. One, one of yeah. the things that you know when you get a PhD, the very first step is I have to examine my assumptions. What are they? And like, for example, I watched a supposed refutation of uh, IP inspiring philosophy and his the whole idea with Matthew and the two donkeys. <laughs> and so, and the, they were, it was based, the person who tried to refute what IP said was, it was based on an assumption that Matthew was purposely going back to the Old Testament and trying to fray, trying to find prophecies and then plant them in his thing. And so just you know, look at your assumptions when you do that. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, here we go. So let's go to the next. That's a big deal. And other nations would have heard about it. You know, the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, somebody would have mentioned, you know, you guys don't have much of a history there. You in Egypt, you got bested by the slave god, but nobody talks about it. Okay. That makes Stop. it unlikely. Oh boy. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna have a fun with this one too. Yeah. Nobody talks about it. All right, let's talk about why. Uh, first of all, where are they now? Some of them are gone. Uh, yeah, I mean, let's let's. I mean, who? Why would the Babylonians or the Assyrians talk about this? They, they're far away. You know, they're not even in in the game here. You know, the Mitanni Empire right now is just falling apart in in the history of of the world. You know. The Assyrians are more more concerned with what's happening in Mitanni than in Egypt. They don't care what's going on in Egypt. You know, they're sort of squabbling over, well, who's going to take over this mess called Mitanni? Okay, so you got that. But, so that leaves the other three he mentions here. The Edomites, the Ammonites, and the Moabites. Now, exactly how many... How many monumental inscriptions do you think we have from those three nations combined? I'll give you a hint. It's more than four and less than six. <laughs> so combined, we have. I five. should say, sorry, it's, it's, it's exactly six. Okay, it's exactly six. I'll tell you right now, it's exactly six. We have six monumental inscriptions for all three nations, and all of them post date the ninth century. Not a single monumental inscription from those three countries predates the ninth century. We have almost no material from these, these cultures. We've got one monumental inscription from Edom. We've got two monumental uh, inscriptions from Ammon, from the Ammonites. And we've got three monumental inscriptions from Moab. 
That's it. So here's Enns coming up and making the claim that, well, you know, we should find something from these nations. You know, if this is such a big deal, they should be talking about it all over the place. You know, scrawling it on their walls. You know, making chiseling monumental inscriptions of this. He should know better. This is, again, another... This is another problem with the, uh, the survivability of the archaeological record. You know, if we don't have any, any other inscriptions of the, of, from that period, from that, that, say, that Exodus period of the late 13th, um, early 12th century, why should we expect them to have that inscriptions about the Exodus should survive? And should know better. Ends know should know how many of these inscriptions actually survived. You know the the whole the, the whole fact that he's making such a big deal about oh well we should have we should have found some records from the Edomites or the Ammonites or the Moabites. Okay, find some other records of the, from them. <laughs> That'd be a great start. How about, how about you start off with a simple receipt for a sheet from them? Okay? We'll start with that. <laughs> you start producing that, then maybe we can take this ejection seriously after about, oh, I don't know, maybe two, three hundred more of these. It's good stuff. And I have Susan said what he he's an American biblical scholar and theologian. He's written widely on hermeneutics, Christianity, and science. And so uh, in history of the Bible and the Old Testament interpretation, just so we know his background. Okay. But he should know better. Okay. He, 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 he should know better that this is not a, a good, good objection. Because you can't expect there to be writing about, say, foreign events when you don't find writing about anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you happen to know if they were, I mean, some of these cultures, one of the reasons I was thinking about it is some of the cultures might not have been, I mean, were they all writers? Were they all cultures that could read and write and that kind of thing? Or was there a... We, we do have writings from them by the Iron Age. Okay. okay. So basically, by the ninth century, most of those cultures will have some sort of writing extent. Most of what we get from them are going to be small seals, though. Usually, Iron Age two seals. Hmm. So there's there's small texts that we have from them, but really the big monumental inscriptions, the one that would actually give us details about, say, something like an Exodus, we just don't find. Those are just not something we find amongst them that material. Hmm. That's interesting. And most of that material, too, dates between, say, the 9th and the 4th centuries BC. So most of it is going to be very late anyway, compared to what we would f expect from an Exodus event. Hmm. Very good. Very good. All right, here we go. Likely that this is a historical account in the way that we understand history. Another thing that's a little bit difficult is just, you know, just reading the story itself, it doesn't read like history it reads like story you know you have c a c Stop. splitting in half you have <laughs> okay before we get into the c splitting in half we'll let him finish that in a moment but just that whole idea it doesn't read like history it reads like a story this is a presentist fallacy it's a presentist fallacy it's saying that it doesn't read like the historical genre we have today, like our historiography, the way we would write history. Therefore, it's not history. Well, no. What it means is that the way they did historiography is not the same as we do historiography. The way we write history is different. It's materially different. But that doesn't make it less historical. 
It just means it's it's written in a different way, and it's written through a different reception history lens. So this whole idea that it doesn't meet our standards, therefore it's a story, it's a myth, well, he needs to read more ancient literature. He needs to read more ancient literature because most history in the ancient world, at least documents that have a historical um, basis, are written that way. They're written like that. You know, they're written with that reception lens of how does these events relate to our religion? You know, you take, for example, uh, the Battle of Kadesh, the inscriptions of Ramses II. You know, this is an undoubtedly a historical event. Every historian says this happened. But you read this, and you get the idea that there's been some, some exaggeration, some amplification. Uh, the gods are involved. You know, Ramses goes, I, Ramses, was abandoned by my army, and I fought like Montu, and Amun Ra came down upon me and, and filled me with the fury of the of the lion <laughs> that's perfect example for this case perfect now that's not going to read like modern historiography you know if, let's say i started writing like that you know in my history book well you know the lord god yahweh filled me with his power and i started to to write like um, like Thomas Aquinas, and the power flowed through my pen. It would be daft, because it doesn't fit our modern historiography standards. It's just as daft to apply our historiography standards today to what people wrote back then. It's equally, it, it's a, and this is why it's a presentist fallacy. Yeah, it's full of fallacies. Yeah. So let's see what he says about the parting. The Nile turning to blood. You have the sun blotted out. You have the death of the firstborn. And these things seem to read like ancient stories that have more of a mythical quality than a historical quality. Stop. <laughs> okay. He mentions four of these plagues. And it's very interesting the ones he mentions. Now, um, he mentions the sea splitting, which is not actually a plague. It's actually the, ex uh, the exodus event itself, the, um, the escape. He mentions the, the river turning to blood. He mentions the sun being blotted out. And he mentions the death of the firstborn. Fortunately, with that one, he doesn't add children to that. Because that would be cringe. <laughs> <laughs> but just taking the ones he, he's mentioned here, the four he's mentioned, three of the four have been documented in historical sources. Okay, Three of the four. The splitting of the sea. Now, the splitting of the sea is not documented in ancient sources. It's documented in modern sources. This is a phenomenon that occurs on the eastern part of the Nile Delta called a wind set down. What will happen is a wind will come from the east and blow down the water, driving the waters apart. Uh, there's been several peer-reviewed papers on this. It's, a modern, it's been documented as happening in recent times. And that's probably what happened was that this this um, this wind set down parted the waters of one of the uh, lakes of the Paleozoic estuary. Now those lakes are only about twenty were only about twenty to forty feet deep, so a wind of fifty miles an hour would be more than adequate to create a wind set down there. So again, this is well documented. It's in peer reviewed publications. You can easily look it up. Okay, so that covers the splitting of the sea. 
So now turning to blood. This was actually recorded in a Middle Kingdom text called the um, Admonitions of Ipaware. It is one of the um, ex eventu prophecy texts of the Middle Kingdom. And it does relate events that happened during the First Intermediate Period. So it did happen once before at least. At least once before the Nile turned to blood. We should also mention too what it means for the Nile to turn to blood. Because it's often not what people think it means. Uh, it's not the Nile turning red. It's the Nile turning black. This is not blood that, oh, I cut my finger. Oh, look, red's, red's coming out of it. It's not that kind of blood. It's the kind of blood that you see on a battlefield. Oozing, black, coagulated, oxidized blood. It's black and it looks like tar. Okay. Sounds like oil. It does. Very reminiscent of oil. Very reminiscent of oil. And that's a possibility that it could have been an oil spill of some, a natural oil spill of some kind in the Nile River. So that is a possibility. But it's been recorded on, an, on an, a second occasion, uh, uh, or another occasion prior to the Exodus. So again, in the admissions of Ipaware. The blotting of the sun uh, is mentioned in the prophecy of Nefertiti. Now, in this particular case, what probably happened was it was a sandstorm mixed with ash. Now, Egypt does get sandstorms. But late in, say, in the late Bronze Age, where you had the, say, the drawing of both, say, the Sahara and the Sinai, there were still some patches of greenery that would sometimes set on fire. Mix that with an ash, you've got the Egyptian equivalent of a, a dust storm or, or you know, um, what's called something... Um, Dust devils, you know, those sort of things where you have, say, ash and fire mixed with the sand itself. So this can, and under those circumstances, you can have a complete blotting out of the sun. So that you, you only see maybe the solar disk and that's about it. So natural As, occurrences. So these Natural these occurrences. occurrences. Yeah. yeah, these have occurred. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are documented as having occurred. Now, we don't... Now, the fourth one, the death of the firstborn, we have to recognize that plagues are very hard to sort of nail down. Um, and we are presuming here that it was a kind of a plague of some kind. And plagues are very, very difficult to, as I say, nail down. For one reason, they happen so often in Egypt. They happen very frequently. So to be able to narrow it down to one specific event is very difficult to begin with. But we do have some things that are very, say, uh, circumstantial about this particular one. Uh, first of all, we do have the death of Amenhir Kopchev, which was Ramses II's firstborn. It also co coincides uh, with the death of Egypt's vizier, uh, which was Passer. Also, there's, um, we also have that cemetery at Avaris that is... You know, starts to be populated right after the um, the the Semites there abandon the city. So while we can't exactly nail down what exactly the death of the firstborn was as far as a kind of event goes, um, we do have some circumstantial evidence that would say at least suggest it. At least it wouldn't invalidate it. That's good stuff. So that's pretty much all I've got here for Peter Enns. The rest of the video is not that interesting, but that's the core of his objections. And I think we covered that pretty well. Yeah, I think we have pretty good timing because you said it kind of uh, we could go about two hours and we're just under that. So I'm, I'm really glad that you've come on and shared so much. You, your knowledge is amazing. And I really hope you write that book. <laughs> so. <laughs> I hope so, too. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. So, David, what are you working on now? Where can people find you next? I, I know you, you do popcorn videos on your channel, which I've linked here in the description and also in the title. But what, what, uh, and I know you don't let people sometimes know what the popcorn video is going to be. Oh, on. we never let people know what the popcorn <laughs> videos are. Oh, no, those are secret. The popcorn <laughs> keeps its secrets. Yeah. So, so is there already, do you have plans for a popcorn video for this Friday? No, I don't. <laughs> we don't, we, on Fridays, we do our live Q and A's. So that's what we do on Fridays. Uh, our basic release schedule is we do a teaching video Monday. Mm -hmm. And if we do a popcorn re video, it will be on a Monday. So that's when we usually will do a popcorn video is Monday evening, as opposed to our regular Monday morning release. Mm -hmm. Then we and do three shorts during the week. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And then Friday, we do a live uh, Q&A, um, basically, where we take people's questions on ancient Egypt and the Bible. And it's a live show. Okay. It's not like a lot of these shows where we get the questions ahead of time and prepare only from the answers we get ahead of time. Mm -hmm. It's not that way. Everything is taken. Basically, it's off the cuff. Yeah, sometimes we get things right, sometimes we get things wrong, because it is off the cut. There's no previous preparation. Mm -hmm. But it is a live show, and basically they they understand what they're getting. We've got a request here for my friend Jansen. I want to say hi to everybody in the chat. We've got some great people. Jansen, uh, Susan, Absurd Scandal, and some other ones. We have 75 people watching, which for my channel, is almost, it's, it's really huge. I never get that many. So thank you. Wow. But, uh, <laughs> Well, I'm glad I could help. <laughs> yeah, so so nice. So please do a popcorn on LDS Dan. Uh, I forget that Dan's last Maclen McClellan Make, that's Mc... it. McClellan. Yeah, yeah. So if you we have we have uh, recommendations now. You're in the past. You've done popcorn videos on some of Dan's friends. So <laughs> um, Dan's a little difficult to do a popcorn review of, honestly. Um, the reason why is he, he tends to only do uh, really, really short videos. So he doesn't ever, he doesn't ever do long day videos. He tends to focus on the short media. So his, his, his stuff is usually a minute or less. That's very difficult to popcorn review because you do need to build up at least a kind of show. Mm -hmm. So we would, if we were ever did something like McClellan, we would have to take a lot of his shorts and do them sequentially. Hmm. Now, that could fall under um, problems with the copyright usage. So he's, he's a tough guy to actually uh, to critique. Uh, we have done a few episodes where we have critiqued some of his material before, but usually not as a popcorn review. Popcorn reviews are very specific in the format that we use. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, they generally have to be between uh, 30 and 60 minutes in length. They have to be something where we um, are not going to get copyright strike. Uh, like, for example, it can't be something that's fictional or owned by a major media company like Disney mm -hmm. or uh, AD Entertainment. <laughs> Ancient <laughs> aliens. <coughs> <laughs> oh, so you did a video. Did you try to do one on those? We tried to do one on Ancient Aliens. Kept getting, kept getting copyright blocked. Oh, that's a bummer. So what we had to do was we had to replace um, all the uh, all the footage with stick figures. So we drew stick figures and put it in its place. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I am I'm very excited that you've come on here today. It's it's just been a pleasure having you on. You guys, I, I've had him on my channel a couple other times. So be sure to look at those videos too if you like this kind of content. Please like and subscribe as well. And so, any other things you want to say? Any final notes on this? crazy video or these two videos we just watched or oh, no but we do have also one other thing to uh to announce there's one other thing we're working on is we are actually doing a tour of egypt oh I an age yes uh in march of next year um there is going to there's there's links in our live streams if you want to get more information about that we are going to be going from uh, basically from Sheikh El Sharm to St. Catharines and then all the way for, to Cairo mm -hmm. and to Aswan and work our way down the Nile River. Oh, so wow. It's going to be a very exciting opportunity to visit Egypt and learn about the relationship between ancient Egypt and the Bible. How long is this trip and how much does it cost? What's the... 
Um, I think the, the starting package is 5,000 US. Okay. Um, it's, I don't remember the, I think it's five days for the base trip, but it can be extended up to 10, I think. Hmm. And plus it would have to do with whatever your flight cost, or people's flight costs and that kind of thing. So there are some very- Well, they, they, do, they do include uh, part of the flight cost in that. So okay. part of that 5,000 is from the, from the flight from New York to Egypt. Hmm. Yeah, so it'd be very educational. I mean, imagine just what you do, you receive right now in these two hours, what you could get if you traveled with David all over Egypt. How cool would that be? That sounds pretty neat. So good stuff. Well, you guys, thank you for, uh, thanks for coming in, everybody. Please like and subscribe. And just remember, whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Thank you. So I'm going to end the stream.